Logan Schendelman had just finished his first year of college at Washington State University. He'd spent a little too much time having fun and not as much attending classes, and so he wasn't able to return and instead planned to get a job, put some money in his pocket, and see where the world would take him. He was on a journey of self-discovery, hoping to find his place in life and within his own community. On May 19th, 2016, Logan told his grandmother that he'd had an epiphany, but before they could discuss it further, she had to go to work. They made plans to talk that evening, but when she returned home, Logan was gone, and as the days passed, she filed a missing persons report which would lead to bizarre eyewitness accounts and the discovery of Logan's car abandoned along Interstate 5, just miles from his home. According to witness accounts, the car had drifted across multiple lanes before crashing into the center divider. One witness reported seeing a man leap from the passenger side, fleeing into the woods. Another told the story of Logan in the company of two men standing near the rear of the vehicle. When examined, in the car were Logan's wallet, ID, money, and his cell phone. There didn't appear to be any signs of a struggle, but for his family and investigators, the items left behind suggested that Logan's disappearance could be the result of foul play. In the two years since, Multiple searches have been launched, media coverage has shared his story nationwide, and the strange stories about two unidentified men seen in his presence depict a confusing situation no one has yet been able to figure out. What happened to Logan Schendelman, and why, two years later, has so little been discovered in connection with this utterly baffling disappearance? This is Trace Evidence. Episode 51, The Disappearance of Logan Schendelman. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today I examine the strange disappearance of 19-year-old Logan Schendelman from Tumwater, Washington in May of 2016. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcatcher. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at traceevpod on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, transcripts, social media links, merchandise, and much more. Trace Evidence is also on Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence where you can get rewards such as stickers, pins, and commercial-free episodes. There's also a PayPal donation link on the website for those of you who don't wish to go through Patreon. This show is a complete one-man operation, and your support is greatly appreciated. Trace Evidence is now a part of the Murderly Podcast Network. Visit murder.ly for more information, and many other amazing true crime podcasts. Today, I examine the disappearance of Logan Schendelman. It's a strange case, with very little evidence that has confounded his family and investigators alike for the past two years. In the time since Logan vanished, little has been found to clear up any of the confusion and mystery surrounding his final hours. This is Episode 51. The Disappearance of Logan Schendelman.
Logan Drew Schendelman was born on June 27, 1996, to his mother Hannah. Logan never knew his father, as he was an engineer working in the United States on a limited visa and later returned home to Saudi Arabia, possibly unaware that he had fathered a child during his time in the country. By all accounts, Hannah had a whirlwind romance with Logan's father, though whether or not there were any discussions about a possible future and the logistics of that future is uncertain. Regardless, Logan was born and raised in Tumwater, Washington. Tumwater sits in Thurston County and is a small city approximately four miles south of Olympia. Tumwater holds a population of just over 20,000 residents and covers 14.9 square miles, and its name translates to mean waterfall. Extensive details about Logan's upbringing are fairly limited, though seem in general to depict what one might describe as a fairly average and normal childhood. Logan was Hannah's second-born, with him having an older half-sister named Chloe. Shortly after his birth, Hannah spoke to her mother, Ginny, Logan's grandmother, and requested that she and the kids come live there for a period of time. Ginny agreed, and the family moved in with their maternal grandmother. Ginny had raised Hannah predominantly on her own as, similar to her daughter, she had gotten involved in a relationship with a man which was short-lived prior to her daughter's birth. Ginny's relationship had been with an African-American male, making Hannah of mixed descent. Logan, as a result, was a combination of Caucasian, African-American, and Saudi Arabian. Tumwater isn't exactly known for its racial diversity, and according to census records, is listed as having a population that is 85% white, with African Americans making up only 1.7%. The nearby larger city of Olympia, with more than two times the population of Tumwater, bears similar metrics, showing only a 2% African American population. Despite the numbers, Tumwater has been described as the kind of city where race isn't considered a big deal. The predominantly Caucasian population is said to have been progressive, and it's far from a place of racial tensions, but of course that's hard to verify. For Logan, cultural diversity would be something he would experience within the realm of his own family. Hannah was of mixed descent. His grandmother Ginny was Caucasian, and he had two great aunts, one of whom was African American, and the other who was Caucasian. There was a division in the family, though. When Logan was young, his mother Hannah decided she wanted to attend art school in Olympia, which would be complicated while raising two young children. In discussions with Ginny, it was decided that Chloe and Logan would stay with her while Hannah pursued a career. In order to put things in order and give Ginny the legal ability to provide medical insurance and to make important decisions, she was granted guardianship of the children. Ginny would raise Chloe and Logan as her own, though Hannah would be around and would visit and spend times with the kids when she could. Their relationship has never been described as strained or difficult. On the other hand, Hannah's father's side of the family was not in the picture. Logan's great aunt, Tina Crary, wouldn't meet him until the year before he disappeared. There's been a lot of discussion about the division of the family, with both sides laying out accusations blaming the other for the rift. On Tina's side, it's been said that Ginny worked actively to exclude that side of the family and had no interest in bringing them together nor to expose Logan to his African-American roots. On Ginny's side, it's been said that while she was always open to having a united family, it was Tina's side which displayed no interest. In an interview, Ginny explained that when Logan was first born, Tina's side of the family made a few attempts to get in touch and see him, but their efforts quickly faded and over the years, little else was done to reconnect. Whoever is telling the truth seems less important than the fact that Logan, for the majority of his life, 
had no contact with this side of his family and was seemingly unaware of their existence, though that remains debated. Suffice it to say, learning the truth about his origins will play a role later in his life. Logan was described by friends and family as being extremely charismatic and having an irresistible personality. His ability to make friends was apparent from a young age and only became more prominent as he got into his teens. His circle of friends expanded quickly, and as he entered Tumwater High School, his popularity would continue to rise, especially once he joined the football team and showed off his skills. Of Logan, Ginny would say, quote, He was kind of a normal teenager. He was happy at school and seemed popular. He had lots of friends. He listened to music, and he wrote poetry. End quote. The poetic side of Logan also came, as it often does for writers, with a somewhat deep private side that the outside rarely sees, and it wasn't uncommon for Logan to spend time alone, writing, listening to music, and just thinking. However, when Logan was out in public with friends and family, he was typically surrounded by smiling faces, and it was obvious to everyone that Logan was skilled at meeting others. He possessed a genuine quality that made others want to be around him, and it was hard to find someone who didn't like him. Logan's uncle Mike would say, quote, Logan has always been the kind of guy that I think just about anybody could make friends with him, and he'd make friends with them. End quote. Logan was said to enjoy making others laugh, and it wasn't uncommon to find him joking around with friends in school. Dakota Tresner, a friend from high school, described Logan by saying he was, quote, never down, always happy. Around school, he was always laughing, joking with people, end quote. Though Logan may have looked different than his predominantly white friends, they have suggested that simply never played a role in their relationship. Logan was a part of the group, and no one gave it a second thought. When it came to school, Logan excelled both on and off the football field. He achieved good grades and helped lead his team to the state championships twice from 2011 to 2014. Logan had grown into an intimidating figure, standing six feet tall and weighing approximately 175 pounds. In his senior year, Logan played on varsity and competed in 14 games, boasting 31 solo tackles and 71 tackles in total, averaging 5.1 tackles per game, deflecting seven passes, and intercepting three while ultimately scoring one touchdown. His intensity on the field was in direct contradiction to the kind and gentle personality outside of the game, and Dakota later said, quote, When the game was going, that kid would smack people. It was awesome. End quote. Ginny attended all of his games, sitting in the bleachers beneath a blanket and freezing, but loving every moment of watching Logan in his element. When asked about Logan's athletic abilities, his Aunt Mary stated, quote, Everybody loved to watch him run the ball. It was just a good time for him. End quote. Everything seemed to be going well in Logan's life. He had a good group of friends. He was finishing up high school with good grades and an excellent performance on the field, and he was looking forward to the next chapter of his life. What that chapter would be, though, he wasn't quite sure. Like many men his age on the verge of adulthood, Logan hadn't yet decided what he wanted to major in or how he wanted to spend the rest of his life. For the time being, that wasn't too much of a worry, as so many students enter college without a specific destination, and part of the process is learning what it is you want to do. He had some plans in place, and was going to be attending Eastern Washington University, and had already made arrangements to share a dorm with a friend. Eastern has multiple campuses offering a wide array of programs, and offered plenty of opportunity. Outside of that, he had the comfort of living with a friend, and many people he'd gone to high school with would also be attending. Things, though, 
were about to change, and Logan would head down a very different path than the one he'd mapped out. The summer between high school and college was meant to be filled with good times, parties, and laughter. It was 2014, and Logan was 18 years old and coming into his own. One night, Logan attended a party with some friends. It was outside and there was a fire going, and everyone was having a good time. Logan laughed and joked around as he usually did, but one attendee began giving him a hard time. According to some people who had been at the party, a young woman began to poke fun at Logan about his ethnicity. She made references to him being of Saudi Arabian descent and about him being part African American also. Logan was extremely upset by her statements, so much so that he called Ginny to come and pick him up. It wasn't just the racial slurs that had gotten to Logan, though. He felt that his friends, some of whom were at that party, didn't stand up for him. While they didn't participate in the harassment, Logan felt that he would have stood up for them, but they said nothing in defense of him, and he began to question not only their loyalty, but whether or not their silence was an admission of the fact that they might agree with the slurs being hurled his way. Ginny later said, quote, She was saying he was Saudi Arabian because his father's from Saudi Arabia, and he should be dancing around the fire and doing songs and just ignorant racist kinds of things. End quote. In terms of his friends at the party, Ginny explained that when they returned home, Logan began talking about his so called friends. According to Ginny, quote, We got home, and he said, they weren't even there for me. I thought I had friends, and I don't. He started feeling very isolated at that point. End quote. Logan's friends felt that they hadn't participated in the disgusting behavior, and they didn't understand why Logan was upset with them. In response to this situation, Logan began to withdraw from his friends. It began slowly, with him simply being around less, and responding to texts a little less frequently, but it quickly became a situation of totally ignoring them. Logan stopped responding to text messages at all, and when his friends would message him via social media, they could see notifications that he'd read their messages, but he simply didn't respond. He began to spend a lot of time at home, in his room, and it was clear that the situation had bothered him, and put him in a position to reevaluate everything. As the summer grew shorter, he made a big decision based on his new outlook. In a conversation with Ginny, Logan expressed that he no longer wished to attend Eastern and instead wanted to change to Washington State University, some 300 miles away. WSU offered Logan a new beginning in a new environment, and while no one is sure, the more diverse student population may have also been a draw for him. He didn't tell his friends about this change in plans. Logan's family have said that, during this time, he seemed for the first time in his life to be a little lost. They have defined this period as a crisis of identity, with Logan deciding that he needed to learn more about his roots and his place in the world. It was during this time that Logan began doing research on his family in an attempt to track down the side of it that he had never met. Eventually, he managed to find his great aunt Tina. After a back and forth conversation via social media, Tina invited Logan over for dinner. At the time, Logan didn't want to tell anyone in the home what he was doing, and a month or so before his planned leave for Washington State University, he drove over to Tina's home to meet, talk, and he hoped to learn more about where he came from. According to Tina, he was hesitant at first and confessed that his grandmother Ginny wouldn't approve of him being there. Regardless, he was driven to learn more about where he came from. Tina would later say, quote, It was always there, and as he got older, he was able to ask more questions and was able to connect the dots, end quote. That night, 
Tina and Logan got to know each other better over dinner, and when the meal was complete, Tina brought out photo albums, giving Logan the opportunity to see relatives he'd heard of, but never met. Tina would go on to say that Logan was extremely happy, and expressed that it was comforting to see his African-American relatives. Tina explained, quote, We looked at lots of pictures. His eyes were just wide, and he was shaking his head. He just stared at it, and he looked up at me and said, It feels so good to see someone who looks like me. End quote. Following their dinner and conversation, Logan told Tina he had to get home. According to her, he requested that she not mention his visit to anyone who might tell Ginny, explaining that she would be very upset with him if she knew he'd gone there. Ginny, though, contradicts this, saying later that Logan told her when he got home that he'd gone to see Tina. Both sides have their own stories, with Tina expressing that Logan had said Ginny hadn't wanted him to meet her and that she'd kept the family secret. Ginny, however, says that when he came home, he explained that Tina had spoken negatively about Ginny and he didn't understand why, since Ginny had, essentially, been the woman who raised him. Obviously, tensions between the two sides of the family were still present, and Logan could feel the tension. Some have debated about how this impacted him, and whether or not he felt pulled between them, but Ginny later said she told Logan that she had no problem with him spending time with that side of his family, that he was an adult, and it was completely up to him. Tina would never see Logan again, though the two would keep in touch through social media. He was preparing to leave for college, to be away from home for the first time in his life, and to be responsible for his own path. He went away to WSU, and for all intents and purposes, while he made friends and spent time getting accustomed to his new surroundings, his focus seemed to be primarily on socializing and having a good time, rather than buckling down for his studies. According to Ginny, he wasn't doing his homework, he wasn't attending classes like he was supposed to, and he may have been spending a lot of his time going to parties. When the year came to an end, his grades had dropped to the point where, even if he'd wanted to, he wasn't able to go back for another semester. Logan elected not to go elsewhere to raise his GPA, and instead, he made the choice to take time away from school and to experience the real world for a while. Throughout his time at WSU and upon returning home, his choice to disconnect from his high school friends continued. Several friends expressed that they'd reached out to him throughout the year, on breaks and during the summer, but as he had previously done, Logan read their messages but never answered. According to several friends, they felt as though he had made the choice to move on with his life and start anew, as though now that he was out of high school and getting older, he no longer wished to associate with people from his past. The happy and smiling Logan they knew seemed to have changed, and his time away at school also appeared to have given him a more brooding personality. A former friend, Alyssa Parrish, said of that summer, quote, he came into my work and brought an application in, and I was like, hey, good to see you. How are you doing? And he didn't say much. He kind of got nervous when I saw him. It was weird. End quote. Nervousness and paranoia are two things which others will begin to see in him as well. Logan would spend the next year of his life out of school and working odd jobs around Tumwater. Most of the work was physical labor, and none of the jobs were exactly the kind of work that made him feel fulfilled. Logan's great aunt Mary would later say that he would do, quote, just about any job he could find to make money. The first job he got was, I believe, with a laundry facility, where they would go around at night and pick up laundry from nursing homes and hospitals. End quote. Mary and Mike owned and operated a five-acre farm, and they would sometimes hire Logan on to assist with some of the more difficult tasks or when Mike needed an extra hand. Mike explained, quote, I needed help cleaning the fields. He helped me with other chores such as ditching for power and water, end quote. The work was hard and exhausting, 
But according to Mike and Mary, Logan enjoyed doing it. He liked feeling useful and felt satisfied after a long, hard day. They paid him good as well, sometimes giving him as much as $20 per hour. By the spring of 2016, Logan was 19 years old and still struggling to figure out not only what he was going to do, but what he wanted to do. According to Ginny, he wasn't living much of a social life at the time. He spent most of his free time home, in his room, with the door closed. He was on the internet a lot, chatting with people he'd never met. This seemed to be a window into making new friends as he'd maintained radio silence with his old friends. According to Mike, Logan wasn't very happy at home during this time period. His sister, Chloe, who still lived in the house, had recently allowed her boyfriend, Jake, to move in. Along with Jake came his two children, and for Logan, things were getting a little crowded, and as many have suggested, he wasn't a big fan of Jake either. The specifics about their interactions aren't very well known, and while some say it was an incredibly tense situation, Ginny has disagreed, explaining, quote, Sometimes they disagreed. I wouldn't call them particularly good friends, but it wasn't like people beating on each other or anything like that, end quote. Jake had a history of violence and had been arrested and was on probation for a domestic situation in which he was ultimately charged with felony assault in 2013. No reports have ever been made about Jake being violent in the home at this time, but it has been hinted that Logan didn't appreciate his demeanor or now living in a home with him and two young children. It's around this time that Logan began going out a little more and started hanging out with a crowd that Ginny never met. He was coming home late at night, sometimes early in the morning, and there were certain things about his behavior that Ginny was becoming concerned about. Whether it was a result of hanging out with a new crowd of people, a way to deal with stress, or simply an activity Logan enjoyed, he began smoking pot. According to Ginny, it wasn't just a little bit here and there, as she later explained, quote, I know he was going someplace and buying pot from somebody because he was smoking quite a bit. End quote. Reportedly, it's at this time that Ginny begins to notice his paranoia is rising. While old friends feel that his behavior was odd if they happen to run into him somewhere, noting that he seemed almost nervous and frightened around them, Ginny notes that his behavior carries over into his home life as well. She attributed it to the amount of marijuana he was smoking, saying, quote, Logan was smoking a lot of pot. He was getting a little bit paranoid sometimes. Sometimes he decided people were looking in his window in his room, so he would lock his door, end quote. The debate will later be about whether or not Logan's paranoia represented a symptom of smoking too much pot, a sign of burgeoning mental illness, or if, perhaps... Logan had been involved in something for which he was afraid of the consequences. Either way, by May 19, 2016, Logan had been out of school for nearly a year, and his quest to find his place in the world would ultimately result in his inexplicable disappearance. Early in the morning on Thursday, May 19, Ginny was getting ready for work. As she stepped into the kitchen, She heard a door close, and Logan walked in from the direction of the garage, not from his bedroom, suggesting that he'd just arrived home. She found it odd that he'd be arriving home at that time, since he usually wasn't out that late. She asked him where he had been and what he'd been up to, but Logan simply responded that he'd been out driving around and thinking. According to her, his body language wasn't right. She later said, quote, He was just really nervous, which he isn't usually. End quote. It's at this point where she feels like Logan has something on his mind that he wants to discuss, and so she begins asking him questions. Logan told Ginny that he'd had an epiphany about something. Wanting to discuss it further, but needing to leave for work, she told him that when she got home from work that night, they should sit down and talk about it. Logan agreed and Ginny told him that she'd see him later that evening. 
This will be the last time Ginny will ever see Logan. What transpired that day has been mired in confusion and mystery for the past two years. Where Logan went, what he was doing, and who, if anyone he was with, has never been discovered. What is known for certain is that when Ginny arrived home that night, Logan wasn't there. She didn't immediately find this odd, as he came and went as he pleased. But as the night went longer, and she hadn't seen nor heard from him, she began getting concerned. Since Logan's phone was on her contract, she logged into the app and used its locator service to check on him. The phone's location showed him in an area near his mother Hannah's home in Olympia, and so Ginny assumed that Logan had gone to see his mother and was safe. She thought little of it for the rest of the night. By the next morning, Ginny's concerns grew by leaps and bounds when she went to speak with Logan and realized he hadn't come home yet. It was unlike Logan to be out all night, and even if he'd been visiting his mother, he never stayed over there. Ginny picked up the phone and called Hannah, checking to see if Logan was available. It's at this time that Hannah explains to Ginny that not only was he not there, he hadn't been there the night before either. Worried, Ginny begins making calls around Tumwater to see if anyone has seen Logan, but every person she talks to explains that they hadn't seen him. While not in an outright panic, Ginny begins to wonder where Logan could possibly be. By the morning of Saturday, May 21st, she made the choice that it was time to get the police involved. Ginny went down to the Thurston County Sheriff's Office with the intention of filing a missing persons report, but when she arrived, she found the office empty. The department is small, and on weekends, they didn't have enough staff to have someone positioned there for walk-ins. At the time, Ginny didn't believe that the situation was an emergency, as she had no indications that anything was wrong other than the fact that Logan hadn't yet returned. So rather than dialing 911 to report him missing, she spent the rest of the weekend trying to track him down, and when she failed to do so, she returned to the sheriff's office on Monday, May 23rd. While filling out a missing persons report, she was asked for the typical details. A description, distinguishing marks, places he usually goes, people he may associate with, and information about his vehicle. According to the sheriff's office, at the time, they aren't given an indication that this may be related to a crime in any way, and so they take a basic report and approach it as a missing person situation. After processing the paperwork, an investigator decided to run down Logan's vehicle information. It's at this point that they discovered that on Friday, May 20th, his car had been impounded by the Washington State Patrol. According to their report, Logan's 1996 black Chrysler Sebring had been found abandoned on the side of the I-5 interstate. The 5 is a 1,400-mile interstate running north and south from Mexico to Canada, crossing through California, Oregon, and Washington. While that interstate covers a large area, Logan's car had been found on the southbound side near mile marker 92, approximately nine miles south of his home in Tumwater, near the community of Maytown. According to authorities, the vehicle had been left in gear and drifted to impact the center divider. It's interesting to note that Logan's vehicle is registered in Ginny's name, so why she hadn't been contacted when the vehicle had been found three days earlier is unknown. At the time it was found, the car was simply thought to be abandoned, so it wasn't processed for evidence, and after speaking with the Washington State Patrol, the car was released into Ginny's custody. She picked it up from the impound lot and drove it home. There didn't appear to be anything wrong inside the car. There was no sign of a struggle, there was no blood, there was nothing which would indicate that a crime had taken place. However, Ginny became concerned when she surveyed what was in the car. Left behind were Logan's wallet, debit card, and license. There was $25 in the wallet, and most curious of all, Logan's cell phone was also in the car. Outside of his personal effects, 
There were a few bags of groceries on the passenger seat and in the center console area. Feeling like the items left behind signify something ominous, Ginny placed a call to the Thurston County Sheriff's Office, where she spoke to Detective Frank Frawley. Frawley agreed to come out and look at the vehicle, but unfortunately, it was going to be difficult to process it after the fact because the vehicle had been, quote, manipulated. It wasn't pure anymore. Different people have been in the vehicle now. Things have been moved. End quote. Essentially, any evidence which may have existed could have been contaminated, and even the state of the car, as it had been when discovered, can't be known for sure since others have been inside of it and it's been moved. Frawley didn't think it was too strange that Logan would have left behind money, but he did find it bothersome that he'd leave behind his cell phone. Like many kids his age, Logan rarely went anywhere without it, and according to friends and family, he was frequently on his phone, regardless of where he was. It's at this point that investigators decided to get pings on his phone, in hopes of tracking where he had been in the last day since he'd been seen, and they also began poring over the report from the state trooper who had impounded the vehicle. They began cross-referencing that area of the I-5, with any 911 calls which may have come in related to Logan's car, or any reports of odd behavior around that time. When Logan's phone was pinged, they found the phone traveling southbound along the I-5 on the 19th, the day Ginny last saw him. In the early morning hours of May 20th, his phone was then traveling northbound on the I-5 into the Tumwater area around 3 a.m. The phone can no longer be tracked as of 3.45 a.m., either due to being shut off or its battery dying. This didn't really answer any questions for investigators. It isn't necessarily odd behavior, and it shows, at a minimum, Logan's phone hadn't traveled very far from home, which seems to indicate that this wasn't a situation of him just deciding to run off somewhere. While looking through the records of 911 calls that day, they found three which referred to Logan's car. One of the callers had reported seeing more than the others, and for investigators, this finally gave them a perspective on how his vehicle ended up on the side of the I-5. A truck driver, who had been driving northbound on the I-5, contacted police with a bizarre story in the hours leading up to Logan's vehicle being discovered. In this call, he reported that Logan's black Chrysler Sebring was drifting across multiple lanes of traffic and had slowly veered into the center divider. According to his report, he witnessed a male climb across the center console, moving from the driver's seat to the passenger side, at which point the man exited the driver's side door, ran across multiple lanes of traffic, and disappeared into the woods. In his initial description, he reported this to have been a tall, skinny white male with brown or red hair, which obviously doesn't fit Logan's description. Authorities weren't sure what to make of this call, feeling that it didn't make a lot of sense. Later, they would acknowledge that the caller specified male, but whether or not he was certain about the man's race is unclear. In addition to the discrepancy in the description, police noted that the vehicle had grocery bags in the center console and passenger seat none of which had fallen over nor been crushed, which to them indicated it was unlikely that someone could crawl across them and exit the vehicle without disturbing them. Of course, this is hard to know for sure as other people had been in the car since it was abandoned. Regardless, police went down to the location where Logan's vehicle had been discovered and began searching the area. Using a ground search, Police employed six dog teams made up of both tracking and cadaver dogs. They used the location of the vehicle as a center point and swept a two-mile radius, going through thick brush and dense forestry in hopes of finding anything related to Logan. The initial search lasted approximately six hours, but no signs of Logan were found and the dogs failed to pick up on any scent which could be tracked. This would be the first of multiple searches, all of which would fail to turn up any results. 
After the ground searches failed, a helicopter utilizing thermal imaging cameras was also used to fly around the area, searching for any heat sources which could indicate Logan or possibly a body. But again, they failed to come up with anything. Mike Ware, himself a former sheriff's deputy, had searched in that area multiple times and reports that there's unlikely anything there, saying, quote, The area is extremely thick and brushy. I've spent hours out there searching myself. Canines were brought in to search, and it's been covered extensively, but nothing has been found. End quote. With no evidence, and really nowhere to go, investigators are essentially back to square one. They visited Ginny's home and asked permission to search Logan's room, which was granted. They also took his laptop into their possession to examine his internet history. During the same time, they began looking through his phone for any people he may have been in communication with. They quickly discovered that Logan had mostly stayed to himself, as co-workers they questioned knew little about Logan, and his high school friends all reported that he hadn't been speaking with them. They only tracked down one person who had been in communication with Logan, a young woman living in Oregon who had been talking with him through a dating app. While the two maintained communication, they had never met in person, and so she was quickly dismissed as having any knowledge about Logan's activities in the days leading up to his disappearance. Again, frustrated and with nowhere to look, police once more turned to the 911 calls from the days surrounding Logan's disappearance. They found the account of a woman who had phoned in to report an African-American male who fit Logan's description. According to this woman, the man had been seen walking down the street, nude from the waist down. The area in which it was reported is a known drug area with a lot of crack houses. Police began to consider the possibility that Logan's paranoia and behavior leading up to his disappearance may indicate that he'd been involved with drug activities. They did bring a search team and once again utilized dogs in the area the woman had reported, but again failed to find anything or track anything related to Logan. While the story is bizarre and disturbing, they could do little to connect it to Logan's disappearance. Detective Frawley later said, quote, Could have been Logan, could have been anybody. End quote. A week after Logan disappeared, on May 26th, investigators got a hit on his social media, which they had been tracking on the off chance that he may still be around somewhere and could log in. There was a post indicating that Logan was at an airport nearby, and for a moment investigators thought they had something, but it was all a mistake. The post about being at the airport was a Facebook memory from the year before, and any excitement generated in the moment was quickly brushed aside. The false airport check-in did lead investigators in a new direction, though. They soon learned that, shortly before his disappearance, Logan had spoken with his mother Hannah and had been asking questions about his father. Hannah is said to have given Logan all of the information she had, and for the first time, Logan learned the truth about his father and his identity. Police began to wonder if it was possible that Logan's disappearance might be connected to a plan for him to leave the country and meet his father. While this was considered a possibility, it was difficult to nail down, as Logan's license had been left behind in his car and his passport was expired. Short of being in possession of false identification, Logan would have no way of traveling outside of the country, let alone to Saudi Arabia. While investigators began looking for any possible leads to connect them to Logan, all roads brought them to dead ends. When questioning family members, Chloe's boyfriend Jake was brought to their attention. Considering his violent history and reports that he and Logan didn't get along, some family members couldn't help but suspect the possibility that he may have had something to do with it. While investigators found this an interesting angle to pursue, Jake himself had stated that he had no idea what happened to Logan. Five long months would pass, and during that time no leads or developments would come along. 
Logan's disappearance remained a bizarre mystery, and while the local media had touched on his story in the weeks surrounding his disappearance, coverage was drying up, and for the most part, Logan's story was beginning to fade. Then, in October of 2016, police were granted the opportunity to question Jake in a more secure setting. He'd been arrested for a parole violation and was sent to jail. While in jail, authorities approached him about taking a polygraph test. Jake acquiesced and was questioned about Logan's disappearance. According to Detective Frawley, Jake was asked if he had anything to do with Logan's disappearance, as well as whether or not he had any knowledge of what may have happened to Logan. Jake's answers were ruled to be honest, and in Frawley's mind, he was not a viable suspect and had successfully completed the polygraph. Mike Ware, though, has stated that he believes polygraphs can be a useful tool, but they can also be beaten, and he isn't ready yet to completely rule Jake out as a possibility. Sadly, investigators were once again in a position where they had nowhere to go with the case. While Logan's disappearance was frustrating, they had nothing to suggest what may have happened. Theories revolved around Logan running off, possibly getting involved in drugs, the onset of a mental illness, and even foul play, although again, they had little to build on. It was during this time that Logan's family began doing whatever they could to contribute to the investigation. While flyers had been previously printed up and handed out, they ramped up production in hopes of reinvigorating public knowledge of Logan's disappearance. They also constructed a Facebook page for Logan. A $10,000 reward was offered for information leading to his location. Mary and Mike began utilizing volunteers to paint rocks. The rocks would have Logan's name on them, and on the back, they would describe his disappearance and provide information with websites to visit for more information or to submit tips. The rocks had been placed all around the world in hopes of drumming up knowledge and attention for Logan's case. Soon, time began passing at a steady clip, and movement on Logan's case came to a grinding halt. Tips slowly began to trickle out, and then there were none. For Logan's family, it was a devastating time of frustration and wonder. What could have happened to him, and why could nothing be found to even indicate where he may have gone? Months passed, and then the one-year anniversary of Logan's disappearance came, at this time, his story had been given a breath of fresh air as local media once again wrote stories discussing the year anniversary and how little had been found since then. While it wasn't a deluge, the coverage did inspire some people to call in with tips. Investigators tracked down all leads they had received, but none of them led anywhere. Then, in June of 2017, 13 months after Logan was last seen, a woman watching television saw the story and it sparked her memory. She had seen Logan before. She picked up the phone and called the Thurston County Sheriff's Department. According to the witness's account, she spotted Logan's car on the side of the I-5 on the morning of May 20th as she was driving into work. At the time she saw it, there was nothing odd or suspicious about it, and she figured someone had run out of gas or had been in an accident and the vehicle had been left behind. On her way home, later that afternoon, she saw the vehicle again, but this time the hood was up. In her account, the witness explained that she saw three men at the vehicle. One of the men was a tall, African-American who she believes to have been Logan. The two other men were Caucasian, and according to her description, one had shoulder-length blonde hair and was wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. The other man was six feet tall and very thin, with thin blonde hair and a bowl cut. She stated that he was wearing jeans which were too short for him and a tank top which was too small for him. It's interesting to note the description of both individuals being skinny, as the truck driver who had previously reported seeing a male jump out of the passenger side door also described him as being skinny. 
Regardless, the witness was brought into the sheriff's department, and through the use of a sketch artist, they were able to complete a composite drawing of one of the men, the one with the longer hair. The witness has gotten a much better view of him than she had the other. This composite has circulated around in connection with Logan's case, but the man has yet to be identified. Sadly, this is the last update in Logan's case, and in the past year since this sighting was reported, little, if anything, has come to light. Police continue to monitor for activity on Logan's bank accounts and social security number, but there's been none since the time of his disappearance. There has not been any activity on his social media either. When Sergeant Carla Carter of the Thurston County Sheriff's Office was asked about the possibilities in Logan's case, she responded, quote, We're not sure what happened, but there was some indication, perhaps, of some burgeoning mental health issues. End quote. For members of the family, they aren't sure what to believe, though while some speculate Logan ran off, others feel it's unlikely he would have done so without telling them. The family has hired a private investigator to look into Logan's disappearance, though nothing has been reported publicly about what may or may not have been discovered. With very little information to go on, there are three essential theories which revolve around Logan's disappearance. The first theory suggests that Logan may have run off by his own choice. There are multiple angles to this theory, with some believing that Logan may have been experiencing the onset of a mental illness, which contributed to his disappearance. Others argue that Logan may have wanted to get away from the situation he was living in, and his frustrations with his former friends, and hoping to start a new life somewhere, while others contend that Logan may have secretly left the area in search of his biological father. The second theory follows a similar line to the first, though it takes the angle that Logan's disappearance may not have been his attempt to run away, but possibly to commit suicide. Many people believe that his choice to isolate himself, his frustration with having done poorly in school, a descent into drug use, and possible mental health issues could have led him to a place of feeling desperate and depressed, and that suicide has to be considered a possibility here. The third and final theory suggests that Logan's disappearance was not in any way related to his own choice, and may have been the result of foul play. There have been a litany of possibilities considered, including but not limited to, Logan being the subject of a random act of violence, a connection to his sister's boyfriend Jake, or perhaps even a debt or incident involving drug dealers. For Logan's family, they find it difficult to accept that two years later, Logan is still missing. Whether or not he is still alive, they simply can't know, but they hope against the growing darkness of their reality that he may be found someday. There's been some debate and speculation within the family about the possibility that Logan may be out there and simply wants to stay away from both sides but for them, they believe that were Logan able to do so, he'd have at least reached out to tell them he was alright. This leaves open a door which, for them, leads to the likelihood that something terrible happened to Logan. When Logan was last seen, he was described as being 6 feet tall and weighing between 150 and 190 pounds. He had black hair and brown eyes, though he normally shaves his head. He has a small scar on his left forearm and was last seen wearing a black windbreaker, jeans, a white t-shirt, and possibly Nike shoes. Logan has a severe allergy to peanuts and is supposed to carry an EpiPen with him, though his EpiPen was left behind. Logan was 19 years old when last seen, though today he would be 22 with his birthday having passed just a few days ago. It's been two years since Logan was last seen by his family, and for those two years they've gone to great lengths to keep his story alive and to bring attention to his disappearance. In terms of many disappearances covered on this show, Logan's case is still very young, and for many, 
This leaves hope in the possibility that he could still be out there somewhere and may yet be returned home safely. Sadly, with a tremendous lack of evidence and information, there's little to go on, and while witnesses have come forward to report seeing Logan on the day he vanished, there have been no accounts of Logan being seen after May 20th, 2016. For the family, his absence is felt daily, but they keep their lights on and doors open should he reappear in Tumwater. Mary Ware, when asked about the search, responded, quote, Every ten minutes I am saying to my husband, maybe this happened, or maybe that happened, but I have no idea. There just doesn't seem to be an explanation. The disappearance of Logan Schendelman is an incredibly frustrating and sad case to look into. I normally don't cover cases that have occurred this recently because of how little information can be available, but in Logan's case, so much about the case seems to suggest that it should be solvable. Somehow, despite that, we've gone two years now and barely anything has been found. This is one of the more highly discussed cases online, with everyone giving their general opinions but everything comes back to the same core theories. I've been looking at this case since it happened, and I've followed the news on it since then. I'm always hoping to see something new, but sadly, it remains a mystery. One of my listeners, Jennifer Leach, has been requesting this case of me since, I believe, around episode 10. I was holding off on it, hoping there would be a break or more information would become available, but that hasn't happened and so I thought this would be a good time to discuss Logan's disappearance and hopefully garner some more attention for it. In a case like this, it seems apparent that somebody knows what happened, and at least at the time, may have been local to Tumwater or the Olympia area. Hopefully, sooner than later, this person or persons will come forward and assuage the grief and sorrow of Logan's family and friends. With so little evidence available, it's difficult to determine what may have happened to Logan. It's one of those cases where almost everything is possible, and yet nothing is available to pinpoint a single theory. In an examination of the theories of Logan's case, the first theory suggests that Logan's disappearance may have been the result of his own choice. The question becomes whether that choice was based around a desire to escape from the life he was living, or possibly, to go and find his biological father. Beginning with the first thought, there is definitely evidence to suggest that Logan was unhappy with where his life was at this time, and he may have been seeking out a new beginning. Starting with the end of his term in high school, Logan had experienced a racist incident. By all accounts, this was really one of the first times in his life he'd dealt with a situation like that. While the slurs themselves were insulting and upsetting, Logan seemed more offended by the lack of action on the part of his friends. No one stood up for him. No one defended him. No one said anything to stick up for this guy who they all claim to like and consider a part of the group. Maybe it's just me, but if I heard someone talking like that to a friend of mine, I would absolutely be there to back them up and defend them. While they didn't understand Logan's anger towards them, it seems clearly evident that friends who won't be there for you aren't really friends at all. Logan confided in his grandmother how upset he was about it, and then strategically began cutting friends out of his life. He changed his college plans to go somewhere where none of them would be, and he didn't tell them, not even the friend with whom he was going to share a dorm. When his friends messaged him, he simply ignored them, and if he happened to run into them somewhere, he barely spoke and got out of the situation as quickly as possible. For all intents and purposes, it seemed like the social structure Logan had grown up in was collapsing, and simultaneously, so was his understanding of his family dynamic. While Logan had become aware throughout his life about the African-American side of his family, the division between both sides had left him with no contact. He lacked knowledge of his roots, and his hunger for this information and his own crisis of identity revolving around the end of his friendships, 
resulted in him seeking validation through his relatives. Shortly before going away to college, Logan connected with his great-aunt Tina, who showed him more into the African-American side of his family, and this seemed to give Logan a sense of purpose and understanding. While away at college, he maintained contact with Tina and continued to be on what many have considered a journey of self-discovery. The division between the two sides of his family may have also caused Logan some stress as he was trying to walk a fine line between determining where he had come from versus how he had been raised. It was after he returned from college that he went to his mother, Hannah, and began asking her questions about his father. What details she gave him is unclear, but it's been stated that she told him, basically, whatever he wanted to know. So in a tight one-year period of his life, Logan disconnected from his friends, discovered more about his African-American roots, and was told the truth about his father. For many people, that's a huge convergence of psychologically overwhelming information. When you factor in that Logan had also begun smoking marijuana and staying out late, it isn't hard to imagine that he may have been in a place in his life where he wasn't sure what to think, where to go, and perhaps who he truly was supposed to be. For many, all of this information may have contributed to Logan's desire to get away from it all and, in a manner of speaking, find himself. Others believe that Logan may have chosen to leave, not necessarily because of the stresses he was dealing with and a desire to escape it all, but that he may have been seeking out his father. To make that connection to his biological father may have been a driving force in Logan's decision-making, and some have suggested that the epiphany he had come to the morning he vanished was that he needed to find this man and come to terms with another piece of his past. It isn't uncommon for children to want to seek out a biological parent when they come to a certain age, and in Logan's case, he'd learned the truth not too long before he disappeared. The idea that he may have searched for his father, or even tried to establish contact, can't be ruled out. Whether or not Logan would have made plans to try and get to Saudi Arabia, though, is a different story entirely. There are, though, several factors involved in the idea of Logan leaving of his own volition, be it due to family issues and inner turmoil, or to meet his father, which call everything into question. One would assume that were Logan looking for someplace new and to begin again, it wouldn't be a wise choice to embark on this journey without a car. The fact that his vehicle was found abandoned less than 10 miles from his home, more than 15 hours after Ginny last saw him, is certainly bizarre. Also, for someone planning to travel, especially if he was planning to travel abroad, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him to leave behind his license, money, and debit card. His passport was expired, and it would be impossible to travel without some form of identification. Some have argued that Logan may have acquired false identification, and while this is possible, it seems an elaborate plan to execute in order to simply go somewhere else. Even if in his heart of hearts, Logan simply wanted to get away from it all, no one believes that he would be careless or selfish enough to not tell someone. He'd have to know that his family would be worried and upset. And for the young man who so many believe to be a kind and gentle soul, it seems completely out of character for him to do something he knows would cause pain and anguish to those he loved. Of course, there are some who believe that Logan's behavior and choices in the weeks leading up to his disappearance may have signified the onset of a mental illness, and if that were the case, then all information about his typical behavior would go out the window, and that leads us to our second theory. In the weeks leading up to Logan's disappearance, two descriptions of him appear more prominently. Firstly, is that he seemed paranoid, which Ginny explained in him believing that people were looking in his windows. She chalked this up to him smoking a lot of marijuana, for which paranoia can be a side effect. The second word that was used a lot was nervous. Logan was behaving as though he was nervous about something. From applying for a job and seeming nervous when an old friend spoke to him, to Ginny describing his demeanor as nervous 
the morning he told her that he'd had an epiphany. Whether or not this behavior was indicative of drug use or the onset of a mental illness has been hotly debated amongst theorists. One illness which has been suggested by members of his own family and investigators alike has been schizophrenia. Schizophrenia typically appears after puberty, and the majority of diagnoses take place between the late teens and mid-thirties. Logan was 19 when he disappeared, so he fits into that range. There are a wide array of symptoms related to the possibility of schizophrenia, but among those that Logan possessed are strange ideas that don't make sense, such as believing that people were looking in his windows, paranoia, dwelling unreasonably on the past, being moody or irritable, fearfulness and anxiety, becoming isolated, and substance abuse. It seems clear that, whether or not Logan was experiencing a mental illness, he certainly shares some of the symptoms associated with schizophrenia. Were Logan experiencing this, his thought processes would have been impacted, his ability to grasp reality could be impaired, and his choices would likely have been based upon irrational factors. For many, this is easily something that could explain why he'd been driving around all night the evening before he disappeared, and how he may have ended up missing in May of 2016. Without further information, it's hard to know, but we are aware that at the time of his disappearance, Logan had no diagnosis, and therefore was not on any medication which would suggest that, at least at the time, things hadn't gotten so severe that people felt there was a problem. This doesn't mean that Logan didn't have some kind of mental health issues, but simply that they hadn't fully bloomed yet. It's also important to note that, at the time, Logan was smoking a large amount of marijuana. While some have argued this may explain his paranoia, others have pointed to multiple studies which have shown that marijuana, consumed in large quantities over short periods of time, can result in short-term psychosis. The long-term effects are not known, though they're debated amongst medical and psychological professionals, but there have been cases studied in which a person was experiencing schizophrenia and bipolar-like symptoms while binging marijuana. We don't know how much weed Logan was smoking, as it's based purely upon Ginny saying it was a lot. While marijuana, mental illness, or the combination of the two certainly could have played roles in Logan's disappearance, we simply can't know for sure but it may go to some length to explain his behavior and travels. That being said, there are so many unanswered questions in this case, it's difficult to narrow it down. Whether Logan left of his own volition, or did so while under the influence of something mind-altering, there are, of course, details which don't fit. There's never been any activity on Logan's bank account or social security number since he was last seen, which would mean that if he were alive, he would have to be either living under a false identity or likely living amongst the homeless. However, there's been no sightings of him. In searches, nothing has ever been found, and while he was obviously still in the same area at the time he vanished, despite hundreds of thousands of flyers bearing his image, no one has seen him. Some people believe that Logan may have made the choice to commit suicide, and that is certainly a possibility that can't be ruled out. But again, we have the issue that there's never been anything found. I could see how leaving behind all of the items he would need to continue his life could suggest that Logan went off with the plan to end his own life, but it's rare for someone to do so while also actively working to conceal the discovery of the remains. We have seen instances where someone has vanished, and then they were later found to be the victim of a suicide in an isolated area. But Logan's ability to get there was inhibited. He was last believed to have been seen at his car on I-5. Unless someone gave him a ride and elected not to tell authorities about it, he'd have to have gone into the wilderness from there. We do have the truck driver who reported seeing a man fleeing into the woods, though his description hardly compares to Logan. While that possibility exists, the area has been searched countless times using tracking and cadaver dogs, and there have never been any hits. 
It could be argued that the radius search simply wasn't wide enough and Logan had a head start, but thermal imaging was used, which covered a much larger area. Neither running off while in an unsettled state of mind nor committing suicide can be completely ruled out, much like everything else in this case. There's simply no evidence available to support any of these possibilities. If indeed Logan ran off, he's managed to remain undetected somewhere for more than two years now. If he made the tragic choice to end his own life, then somehow he has done so in a location where, for now, he has yet to be discovered. The final theory goes a different direction, speculating that Logan's disappearance was not of his own choice, but instead the result of foul play. When it comes to foul play in this case, there are a few different directions this theory tends to go. Firstly, many believe that Logan may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time and become the victim of a random act of violence. During the night Logan vanished, his phone traveled from his home down into southern Washington before returning back and ultimately being left just nine miles from his house. Some believe that it wasn't Logan who left the vehicle where it was found and that he had been carjacked at some point in time. The truck driver's account of seeing someone jumping out of the passenger side of Logan's car is difficult to follow. While it's a bizarre story with an intriguing angle, as authorities have pointed out, you're being told this story by someone who's buzzing by at 50 to 60 miles per hour, at least. That doesn't leave a lot of time to get a good description of who it was that exited the vehicle, and whether or not it was Logan is still debated today. Under the assumption that the truck driver was correct, the man he described does not sound like Logan, which for many grants credence to the possibility that Logan's car had been stolen and the thief, after crashing it, fled the scene. We also have the eyewitness account of a woman who claims that she saw a man she believed to be Logan standing near the rear of the car with the hood up in the company of two Caucasian men. Some believe that these men could have been in the process of robbing or carjacking Logan and that at some point the car experienced an issue which resulted in it drifting across the five and ending up against the center divider. While this is an interesting theory, it's also strange to imagine that after the car crashed, the two assailants would remain in the area with Logan in public view, rather than simply trying to get away, knowing he couldn't pursue them, and while he could tell the police about them, it would be unlikely that they'd be found. There are two aspects of the carjacking theory which make me question it. The first one being, why would a carjacker leave money in the car? And the second being, Logan's location itself. If the second account is to be believed, it would be difficult for these two men to have possibly murdered and disposed of Logan without a method of transportation. They could have taken him into the woods that day, but again, how would searches have failed to find anything? It unfortunately wouldn't be the first time search teams missed something, but considering how fresh the site would have been, it's hard to imagine that multiple cadaver dogs over several searches would have failed to indicate anything. If the first account is to be believed, then it's highly possible that Logan was carjacked and had something done to him elsewhere, really anywhere between where his car was found and its pinged locations in southern Washington. What bothers me about this is that the pings have always been associated with I-5, and short of Logan picking up a hitchhiker who had bad intentions, it doesn't appear that there's a lot of opportunity for someone to have come up to his vehicle since he wouldn't have been stopped. Of course, there are possible scenarios, such as forcing a slight accident or indicating to Logan that something was wrong in order to get him to have pulled over, at which point he could have been attacked. If this happened, Logan could have been disposed of in multiple locations. Washington has a great deal of wilderness, and therefore a large quantity of locations where a body may be concealed and never found. While a random act of violence is definitely possible, others have argued that Logan may have faced some kind of issue with someone he knew, mainly his half-sister's boyfriend, Jake. What little we know about Jake does not paint a very flattering portrait. However, outside of knowing that he had been arrested for domestic violence and then later violated his parole, we know very little about him. 
According to police, some members of Logan's family believe that Jake could have been involved, and they told a complicated story about Logan and Jake having a great deal of tension between them. Logan had allegedly told some family members that he didn't like living in the house anymore because Jake was there. Ginny, though, argues that while Logan and Jake weren't friends, they managed to get along well enough and there were no major disputes between them. This theory would go to motive, and while Jake may not have liked Logan, he doesn't have a history of murder. He has committed domestic violence, which makes me immediately hate him, but that seems to display a pattern of attack on women, not so much larger, stronger men who might have given him a run for his money. Also, I have to believe that investigators would have done checks on Jake's whereabouts during the time that Logan's car was being driven around southern Washington and the time that witnesses reported seeing it abandoned along I-5. While Jake is a possibility, authorities haven't shared a great deal about their investigation into him, other than giving him a polygraph test, which they argue he passed. The dependability of polygraphs aside, it seems unlikely that authorities wouldn't have dug into his life if they thought he was responsible, and to me, even less likely that any members of Logan's family would defend him if they believed he may be involved. One final angle of this theory connects to drugs. Some have suggested that Logan may have gotten himself into a situation with drugs or a drug dealer in which someone was after him or he owed a debt. Again, we have little to follow up on this other than the fact that Logan was smoking marijuana at the time. There was a report of an African American walking down the street, nude from the waist down, within days of Logan's disappearance, but that was never verified by authorities and that area was searched extensively and nothing was found. Since we know Logan was involved with drugs to some degree, this isn't a theory which can be ruled out right now. Authorities obviously took the Naked Man report seriously enough in a possible connection to Logan to imply that they must have believed, at some point, that his drug problems may have involved more than marijuana. If indeed they did, Logan could have been encountering any number of unsavory individuals dealing with more illicit drugs. The question would be, what could Logan have done that would put his life at risk? And if he was nervous enough that people might be looking in his windows at night, why would he elect to drive around in the middle of the night by himself? It doesn't make a great deal of sense. Some have even gone so far as to believe that Logan may have gotten involved in running drugs, which might explain his long drives in the days leading up to his disappearance. But again, like so many of the angles and possibilities in this case, we simply don't have enough information to determine anything for sure. The idea that Logan could have had someone after him, or even that he had been working for someone who wasn't after him, but ultimately chose to do something terrible for reasons unknown, can't be discounted. All we have to go on, when it comes down to what could have happened to Logan, are two unverified eyewitness accounts putting him, and possibly one to two unidentified individuals, in the area where his car was found abandoned. That's really it. There have been no major sightings. There haven't been discoveries of evidence. There was nothing in the car to indicate foul play. It's an incredibly bizarre and frustrating situation where simultaneously everything and nothing is possible. The disappearance of Logan Schendelman is an incredibly sad story to tell. A bright young man with endless possibilities in his future simply vanishes without a trace. Left behind in the wake of this horrible incident are his car, personal effects, and a family left seeking answers. At night, they think of Logan as they climb into their beds and pull up their blankets. They can't help but wonder if he is warm, if he is safe, if he is all right. For two years now, they've done all they can to bring attention to his case and to stir up leads. But outside of two witness accounts, they still have no ideas or possibilities about what may have happened. For a case still fairly fresh in terms of many which have gone incredibly cold, the possibility remains that Logan Schendelman may be found and this mystery solved. We can only hope that if, 
and when a resolution does come, it is not one with tragic consequences. Until that day, the disappearance of Logan Schendelman remains open, cold, and unsolved. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Logan Schendelman, there are many websites discussing his case and news articles reviewing the available information. His family has established a Facebook page entitled Logan Schendelman is Missing. His case has been examined on Disappeared and Dateline. If you have any information about the disappearance of Logan Schendelman, please contact the Thurston County Sheriff's Department at 360-786-5599. What do you believe happened to Logan? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, Instagram me at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or join the Facebook group. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast app you're using. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the more people are able to hear these unsolved cases. For more information about other cases, transcripts, media, and more, please visit the website at trace-evidence.com. If you're not currently aware, in Episode 10 I discussed the bizarre murder of Arliss Perry. This week, the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department revealed that they had discovered who committed this heinous crime. I released a bonus update episode last week and have attached the new information to the end of episode 10. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence, and a special thanks to Patreon producers Lynn Merschel and Krista Colvin. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.